Good evening. Uh, my name is Deb Mark and I serve as Assistant Director of Advocacy and Social Justice Education in the Office of Civic and Community Engagement. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight for our third installment of the Defending Democracy series, Reimagining Democracy, Taking Civic Action, co-sponsored by the Office of the Provost, Deeks Decide, and the Social Justice Incubator. In the midst of the 2020 election, we saw extraordinary political and electoral organizing that resulted in historic levels of engagement. However, political tension and unrest persists today. And I am so excited to be joined by our panelists, um, Alyssa Ed Ellis, um, Advocacy Director at Democracy NC. <clears throat> Alyssa focuses on advancing pro-democracy initiatives across the state, utilizing research, policy analysis, and advocacy. Before joining Democracy NC, she was the Regional Immigrants Rights Strategist at the ACLU of North Carolina, working to disrupt the deportation pipeline in the Southeast. Prior to her work at the ACLU, Alyssa served as the Deputy Director at two different organizations, focusing on advancing social justice causes across North Carolina. Alyssa obtained her BA in Political Science and her JD at UNC Chapel Hill. Outside of her work, she serves on the board of two local nonprofits, the Carolina Abortion Fund and Action for Community. She currently lives in Durham with her son and her rowdy and very cute dog. We are also joined today by Jake geller Goad, who serves as the campus organizing director with You Can Vote, leading statewide nonpartisan student voter engagement efforts. Previously, he has worked as a student support staff person at Wake Forest University, including volunteering with the Deeds to Side Planning Committee in 2018, and for five years as an, organizing, as an organizer and volunteer coordinator with Democracy NC. Jake holds a master of, Master's of Public Administration from NC State and serves on the board of directors at the Winston-Salem North Star LGBTQ Center. Today, our panelists will share their expertise, give us their insights. However, we're excited to hear from you all as well. Please feel free to utilize the Q&A function to submit a question um, if you're on the webinar. And if you're watching via Facebook, please feel free to drop a question in the comments. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started um, with our first question. We've heard a bit about you from your bios, but could both of you tell us a little bit more about your role and organization and the work that y'all do to reimagine our democracy. I can start um, if we're going in alphabetical order. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Deb. Um, my name is Alyssa, as Deb mentioned, and I work with Democracy North Carolina, and I'm the advocacy director there. Um, so Democracy North Carolina's primary focus is um, you know, voting rights, structural democracy issues, and that runs the gamut from election administration, um, election law and policy, also to good governance issues like campaign finance and redistricting. Um, we have a long legacy as an organization. We've been around for over 30 years. Um, and actually we started as a, a project of the Institute for Southern Studies and we're deeply involved in like good governance, campaign finance, money out of politics work. And so we've continued that work, um, you know, into many decades later, but work primarily on voting rights. And so the advocacy department is really, I would say in democracy and sees um, kind of sphere of work, the technical experts and assistants. So we have organizers on the ground across the state um, who work with our organizing team and we have an amazing communications and campaigns outfit. And our job on the advocacy side is to do a lot of the deep research and policy to support the work that they're doing. And also to, um, I would say, create a feedback loop between the folks who are organizing around pro-democracy initiatives on the ground um, and the folks who may be more kind of technocratic. So, you know, in that lane, I'm a registered lobbyist. I work with legislators. I work with the State Board of Elections. And so we're really intentional about trying to break down the barriers of information um, so that it's more accessible to organizers, to the communities that they're in, and to voters just generally. And so that's a little bit about kind of our role as the advocacy department within Democracy NC's work. Great, and um, 
I'll add in, I'm a big fan of Democracy North Carolina as a former democracy person myself. But hey, everyone, uh, my name is Jake geller Goad, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the campus organizing director with You Can Vote. So You Can Vote is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization, and we do a lot of voter engagement work. And that work happens both in the community sphere and on college campuses. And as the campus director, I lead our campus work with college campuses, with college students, like many of you all who may be tuning in tonight. And so my work often looks like registering voters on campus. I lead our staff across the state who do the campus work. And so you may have seen us out there on your campus wearing orange t-shirts like I'm wearing today, registering voters out there with a clipboard or at a table. We register students on quads and in student centers. And my colleagues who do the community work do that work as well in detention centers with communities of faith. They go to libraries and grocery stores downtown. Like there's a lot of kind of on the ground voter registration and voter education work happening. But for my side, it really is engaging with the students, both the registration and also the education piece. We really believe that voter registration and education have to be paired together. And a part of the way we do that is we go speak directly to students. We do that in classrooms. So whenever a professor will invite us into their space, whether virtually or in person, as it becomes safe to do so, we go into those spaces and speak for 15 to 20 minutes about the voting basics, about how voting works, and go ahead and get anyone registered to vote who wants to get registered. We also do that with student groups, whether student government, student clubs, Greek life, or what have you. So hint, hint, come invite me to come speak. I'd love to talk to your group. But yeah, that's You Can Vote and my work in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and thank you for all the work that both of your organizations do. It's super crucial um, and important to have as many people um, in many different facets doing this work. Um, I think that it would be helpful to take a moment and think back um, to 2020. Um, for many, it was an unprecedented year um, where major storms and fires raged throughout the country and the world. Political tension seemed at an all time high, um, particularly with the spread of mis and disinformation. Um, we saw a lot of racial injustice, um, all in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, affecting hundreds of thousands of people um, and families. However, we saw historic numbers of people turning out to vote. Um, Pew indicates that nearly two thirds of eligible voters turned out. Um, people put a lot of energy into phone banking, into text banking, making plans to vote. And one question that I get a lot is what, what now? Like I put all my energy um, into doing, into the election, the election has happened, it's over. Um, so what do I do next? So for you all, um, what are the two or three areas or things or issues that people should be turning their attention to or putting their energy into now? Um, and Alyssa, if you wanna get us started. Sure. So, I mean, 2020 was unprecedented in many ways and definitely in the election space. And so I will say there were some kind of amazing bipartisan policies that were pro-voter policies that were passed in 2020, including one witness requirement for absentee ballots. When previously we had two witnesses that were required, they lowered the age for poll workers. So it allowed young folks who were 17 years old to become poll workers and you didn't have to be 18 years old. And there are some other really great pieces in terms of absentee ballot re um, receipt deadlines that gave more leeway for ballots that were mailed and postmarked by election day, but came a little later than the window. And so I think one of our first things is getting folks plugged into both federal and state level pro-democracy reform initiatives that are taking place. So folks may have heard that HR1 for the People Act um, on the federal level could do some really, really important things that would help North Carolina. Um, you know, it has some aspects of voter registration, some aspects around early voting. And so I think really getting educated on some of these major election reform bills, that could be some of the most important federal legislation that we've seen in a very long time as it comes to voting and it could improve a lot of what North Carolinians experience um, when they go to try and vote. And then on the state level, you know, we're really, really pushing for legislators to introduce some good pro-voter bills. You know, there were a lot of 
um, kind of missed opportunities in 2020, like to get secure drop boxes, to get online voter registration expanded, to even think about things, you know, that are common for other states like automatic voter registration, you know, to think a little bit kind of beyond just our nose on what we can do to make voting more accessible for North Carolina. And so I'd say the first thing is kind of plugging in um, and a lot's been written, I'd say in the popular media and news outlets about voting rights and the attacks on voting rights. So kind of learning about that and what our legislature um, is gonna do. And then the next big thing I would say is redistricting. So we're operating a little bit of and in an unknown, uncharted territory, because the you know pandemic last year delayed a lot of the census results, and so we know that we won't have data for some time. But I think you know a real transparent um, redistricting process is important for all North Carolinians because we know that you know political and racial gerrymandering has diluted a lot of power for Black and Brown communities. And so it's essential that folks kind of educate themselves. Our good friends at Southern Coalition for Social Justice have a great um, program called the Crowd Academy, where you can get trained to understand a lot of the redistricting nuts and bolts. Um, and although we probably won't see progressive redistricting reform in North Carolina, because that would take a constitutional amendment, there's a lot of ways to put pressure on legislators to make sure that they engage in a fair and transparent redistricting process. So I'd say those are kind of the two big structural things for statewide work. Um, and just, I know you didn't say three, but third one, I would say if I could squeeze one in there on the local level is just get in touch with your county board of elections, see what they're meeting about, see what they're talking about. Democracy North Carolina um, has kind of a monitoring program to keep tabs on what county boards of elections are doing. So, you know, keep your ear to the ground in your local community if you can. Yeah. And I don't have a lot to add other than I want to just second everything that Alyssa just shared because that's all right on the money. But yeah, 2020 was not a one and done situation. Yes, we had some record high turnouts in some ways in North Carolina and across the country, but we know that voting is a habit. Voting, we've looked at the research, suggests that if you vote three elections in a row, first three elections are eligible, that's what really builds the habit. So when we're thinking about working with student voters especially, we want to make sure voters are thinking about not just voting in the big election years, but also those municipal elections and the midterm elections where you can have the most impact that are even closer to home. So we're hoping you'll be interested in those. And there's going to be really high interest, we believe, in those elections coming off such a big election. Here in Winston-Salem, we do things a little different than much of the rest of the state. You may know that uh, many municipalities across the state would typically have their municipal elections during odd numbered years, whereas Winston-Salem, we wait until even numbered years and include our municipal elections along with their midterms. However, because of the census delay that was just mentioned, that impacts in some ways the districts and shapes for municipal elections. So right now the General Assembly is looking into the possibility of switching up or delaying some municipal elections. We still don't know how elections will happen across the state, but for you all who are voting in Winston-Salem at Wake Forest University, you will at least know that the municipal elections are really tied into the midterm elections that are coming up. And um, what was just said about paying attention to the Board of Elections, that really matters. Part of the reason we had such high turnout was just what was mentioned. It was the vote by mail being made easier. It was the introduction of online voter registration. It was those other tools that made it more accessible. And one of the ways you all at Wake Forest University had more accessible voting was by having an early voting camp site by campus for the first time. You had it right across the street, right across Polo Road. Folks would walk there. I saw the Deeks Decides parades and marches like heading up there pretty regularly. Like, that's how you make voting work for everyone is you make it accessible. So yes, please attend your Board of Elections meetings and keep an eye on what's going on there. And just make sure you are participating as a voter and that you're using relational organizing, that you're connecting with your friends and networks. Registering to vote is something you need to do. You need to update your registration each time you move. So if anyone here needs to check the registration, maybe you've changed dorms or apartments since you last registered, check out youcanvote.org slash register and we'll walk you through the process online. If you're able to do online registration, we've got you set up with that link. For some students who aren't DMV customers, who don't have a North Carolina driver's license or North Carolina DMV issued ID, if you're not a North Carolina DMV customer, you can't really access the online registration but we'll actually mail you a form. So we've got a one-stop shop at youcanvote.org slash register that will get you all set up.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. We were really excited um, to have the polling location um, this year, particularly because um, because of redistricting, um, campus is actually divided into two different precincts. So North um, Campus and South Campus, um, which can be really confusing for folks um, who move across campus. Um, and so having that space where you could go and do one stop uh, voter registration and vote um, was really helpful for a lot of our students. Um, and you both kind of touched a little bit on this. Um, and as, across the country, we are seeing a lot of legislation proposals um, that are limiting and suppressing voting rights that disproportionately impact marginalized communities, um, such as people of color, trans people, um, formerly incarcerated folks, um, in a time that most would argue that voting rights need to be expanded. Um, what is being organized here in North Carolina or in other states to make sure that the system becomes fairer and more reflective of where we're at as a society? I don't want to keep going first, but I, I guess I will for this question. Um, so, you know, I think we are concerned about the voter integrity bills, which is such a misnomer because they're really voter suppression bills. Um, that are being introduced in similar, you know, neighboring states in Georgia and Florida and Texas. Um, and then, you know, I think now the total tally is around 43 states have bills in their legislators that are, um, you know, suppressive tactics. And as you mentioned, come from a historical legacy of trying to disenfranchise black folks and communities of color um, and impoverished communities as well. And so I, I will say that we sit with You Can Vote in some really amazing coalition spaces where we're working, you know, on a proactive plan so that I would say when, not if, you know, a bill comes to North Carolina, we're ready to organize and to mobilize around it. And so I'll say key to some of the kind of technical work that we're doing on the back end is really understanding what these laws are seeking to do in other states so that when a law comes to North Carolina, the analysis can go a little more quickly and we can understand, you know, exactly how they're trying to target specific populations. And anyone who's lived in North Carolina for an extended period of time knows that we are constantly, you know, a um, creative play space for a lot of really, really little C, I would say, conservative um, and regressive policies. And, you know, voting rights is no exception. And so we know that there's a, a legacy of trying to limit in-person voting, especially the early voting and same day registration, as you just mentioned. Um, um, and I think we're anticipating that these integrity bills will do just that. They'll try and enforce photo ID, which is currently enjoined. Um, be a litigation lawsuit. Um, they'll probably try to strip the State Board of Elections of some of its really important powers. Um, it's probably going to attack vote by mail because we saw a really big shift in voter behavior with more Black voters choosing to vote by mail, um, more older white voters actually using in-person same-day registration, and a little shameless plug, Dem and C will have a turnout report um, in the next week or so that's going to highlight some of these changes and some of the patterns of online voter registration um, and some of the kind of more progressive policies we have. And so I think the first thing is understanding the tactic strategies and what they're trying to push forward. Um, and the second is, I'll just say kind of in the technical advocacy space is getting legislators up to speed because they're using the scare tactics that we've seen before, like allegations of rampant voter fraud, um, you know, things that are just frankly unfounded and really another form of misinformation and disinformation. And so equipping legislators with the tools um, and then of course, equipping the public with the tools to understand the issue that voter fraud is kind of just a, a false flag that's being, you know, propped up to attack um, the ability, particularly for black um, voters to access things like vote by mail. And so we work with a lot of organizations um, that have robust campaigns and initiatives and we ourselves do a lot of that. So digital actions in your inbox, you know, being ready to, even if you're getting a bunch of emails about a bad bill that's coming up, it's really important to hammer away um, at the stakeholders and, and make sure that they understand that, you know, you want them to vote in favor of pro voter policies and legislation and to vote against these supposed election integrity bills. 
I agree. And yeah, I'm definitely watching what's happening at the state level. And my eyes are also really on the For the People Act, HR1, SR1, in the House and the Senate. It's passed the House already, and it's now over to the U.S. Senate. And it's a national level bill that would affect voting access, campaign finance, redistricting reform at the congressional level, not necessarily at the state level, but it does so much good work. So I'm keeping a close eye on that. But I should be clear that You Can Vote is not an advocacy or lobbying organization. That work is deeply important and there are many groups that do it. Democracy North Carolina does it really well. There are folks out there like the League of Women Voters, Fair Vote, the NAACP, the ACLU. A lot of groups do that important work of shaping policy by lobbying their way there, by suing their way there, by all the different things you do to shape policy. That's really important work. You Can Vote finds their niche, finds their side of things on the practice side of things. We see voter equity as an issue of both policy and of practice. And there are really good groups doing the policy side. So we try to step in at the practice side. We try to be the folks who are on the ground doing the voter registration, passing that handout to folks, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation in person in the spaces where that needs to happen. So in addition to doing public speaking engagements, we're out there doing voter registration drives. I think I already mentioned, we do work across high schools and colleges, detention centers, out there in the community at libraries, grocery stores, hanging out downtown. We do that kind of work all across the state doing voter registration and voter education. Additionally, we put up um, these orange help tents at various voting sites across the state to have kind of a nonpartisan support table outside of the voting site. It helps educate people. It helps have some folks there who aren't one partisan end or the other who can be kind of a neutral arbiter to support folks. I think it helps deter bad actors or intimidators by seeing a community, a nonpartisan presence there but we really dive in on the side of the work, the practice of voter registration and education, meeting folks where they're at and engaging in those efforts. Thank you both. I think um, as kind of a follow-up question, you both talk a little bit about education, um, staying aware. Um, with a lot of misinformation and disinformation floating around, uh, a question that we get a lot is like, where should we be tuning in um, to find all of this information, to stay attuned to what's going on across um, the state? Um you Can Vote's website has a lot of great resources. Uh, Democracy NC, the ncvoter.org. I have used that so many times myself. It's really helpful. The um, 888 Air Vote Hotline that Democracy and lawyers and other groups run. There's a, both a national level version and a state level version. There's really good information there. But I think getting on the right listservs, following the right social media from You Can Vote, from Democracy, from the other organizations, it's a constant change. You're not going to learn the rules for voting and it's going to be the same the next year. I've been in North Carolina all my life. I don't know that there's ever been the same set of rules for voting two years in a row. And that's not always a bad thing. Many times it's because progress has been made around same day registration, around early voting, around reforms that make voting more accessible. And so I think just staying plugged in is a really important way. Definitely. So I'll echo that like in the age of social media, I think for every good piece of information around voting or any issue really, there is bad information floating everywhere. And so I, I do want to tip my hat to um, Common Cause who did a lot of work. They created this thing called Junkopedia, which was like all this election misinformation. Um, and I think one of the things to know is that you know, never amplify election misinformation. Feel free to drop something like ncvoter.org, You Can Vote's website, Democracy NC's website, because there's a lot of good information there. And as Jake mentioned, you know, we actually had a really, you know, kind of challenging vote by mail period in 2020 because the way to cure, you know, mistakes with your absentee ballot envelope changed three times in basically one month while people were actively voting by mail. And so I will say that organizations like You Can Vote who are on the ground having conversation with voters, meeting, you know, with youth groups and organizations across the state is a really good way to plug in. Democracy North Carolina has coalition meetings um, on a monthly basis based on regions in the state. And we are in some rural regions that other, you know, organizations aren't always able to get to, like Robeson County in the Southeast, way far out in the West, beyond Buncombe and Watauga. 
um, and in the Northeast as well. And so I think plugging in to coalition spaces will give you access to kind of updated information, but ncvoter.org, you know, we field and fact check all of the information that's on that website. A lot of it comes from the State Board of Elections and we work with our lovely friends at Southern Coalition for Social Justice who are you know, deep expertise in voting rights litigation. So every time new guidance comes out, when the winds shift and policies change, we work to make sure that everything's up to date. And one thing that I will as a little teaser about NC Voter is we are going through a whole process to make it more, even more user-friendly and more mobile user-friendly, which is really exciting. Um, and we will be partnering with a big organization that works a lot with Spanish speaking populations to make sure that all of this information is accessible in Spanish because we do know that language access oftentimes creates barriers as well. And so we work a lot with our friends at NC NCAT, um, North Carolina Asians Advancing Together, um, and we've worked with other folks to make sure that our 866 hotline and a lot of our key resources are available um, in multilingual um, spaces as well so that we're not only sharing um, English, you know, materials because some folks preferred language is not um, English. We want to honor all voters. I would build on that too with um, Vote411 is a website put out by our friends at the League of Women Voters and it's a great nonpartisan resource for voting information. And for those of you at Wake Forest University, um, I would encourage you to look up Director Roz Tedford over in the ZSR library, does great courses and special sessions on how to identify misinformation and fake news. And so if you wanna be able to help weed out what isn't real as you're paying attention to all this, you all have a great resource right there at your university. Thank you. Um, I think that this leads into a really great space. Both of you talk about, you know, being active in your community, um, getting plugged in um, and figuring out what that looks like. And I know that both of you are active in your communities outside of your work, um, but for folks who are new to this process, um, how can they get involved? Where should they start? Um, there's so many different organizations out there. I mean, in Winston, I think Forsyth County has like 400 different nonprofits <laughs> alone. Um, so what ways can people get involved in their communities, participate in the political process um, outside of voting? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in first and share a few thoughts on that front. Um, I'm here in Winston-Salem, so some of my additional plugging in is right here in Winston-Salem. For example, in addition to my job, I am recently joined the North Star LGBTQ Center's Board of Directors, and there's great work there, but there are lots of boards you can join. I don't know if everyone knows, but a lot of the work that happens in both cities and counties is really driven by volunteer advisory boards, where folks can attend them, see what's going on, and then you can join them and help drive the conversation and drive the decisions that are happening. And um, here in Winston-Salem, there are a number of them. So if you care about issues like racial justice, maybe you want to look into the Human Relations Commission. If you compare, care about environmental issues, maybe you want to look at a Parks and Rec board or a local environmental protection board. If you care about youth issues, there's actually many um, spaces across the state, many cities and counties that have youth advisory boards or even college advisory boards. Here in Winston-Salem, we specifically have a college advisory board that is designed to be really accessible for college students. Many advisory boards might have a two or a three year term, but the Winston-Salem College Advisory Board has a term that matches up with an academic year. They meet from September through May. So if you wanted to check that out and be thinking about that for next year, just Google Winston-Salem Advisory Boards and you'll find all the information about what it is, how to apply, maybe to go to a, attend a meeting. I'd also encourage you to attend your city council meetings. All of those are virtual these days, so you don't have to go downtown into a stuffy room there. You can just log in from home and watch the city council meeting. Um, I know personally this isn't a you can vote issue, but I like to watch what's going on with the city council. And I know in previous years, the city council has voted on things like renaming the Dixie Classic Fair to the Carolina Classic Fair, on tearing down the Confederate statue downtown. And even just next week, we just heard that they'll be considering an issue of a LGBTQ non-discrimination ordinance that also includes other issues as well. That non-discrimination ordinance is being considered next week on Monday. 
So a lot of interesting stuff that's happening really close to home happens at that local government level. So I'd encourage you to consider joining or at least attending some advisory boards. Check out that college advisory board for Winston-Salem. Check out your city council meetings. And as we've already talked about, pay attention to the Forsyth County Board of Elections or whatever county you reside in, that board of elections. A lot of the work for elections is administered at a county level. We have 100 counties across the state, so we have 100 county boards of elections. And so there are meetings for you to attend. The Forsyth County Board of Elections is where important decisions are made about where voting sites and hours will be, including the early voting sites and hours. So decisions about whether Wake Forest University, for example, had an early voting site right there by campus, right on campus, that was made at that level. So you can go to that space, you can hear what's going on, you can build relationships with the folks in that space, and they have public comments, so you can weigh in with your thoughts about how things should go. So yeah, attend your board of elections meeting, attend your city council meetings, and consider joining a local uh, advisory board, especially that Winston-Salem College Advisory Board, to make sure you're having your voice in that space. Yeah, just to add on a little bit, I think, you know, definitely tuning in to local meetings, even, you know, school board meetings, a lot of times they're discussing various issues like school discipline, um, student resource or school resource officers, which is a nice word for saying cops in schools. Um, you know, for a time I was on the justice and action committee for the town of Chapel Hill, which is interesting um, and worked a lot there on some of the kind of policing reform work. And I would just say, as you tune into those meetings, if you hear folks from organizations giving public comment that's interesting to you, Google their name, you know, reach out to them. Um, I'm on the board of the Carolina Abortion Fund and we get a lot of folks who are interested. Actually right now, we're kind of in an open call situation trying to solicit folks to join our board. Um, and we're a working board, so we're supporting the helpline um, that provides money and mutual aid for abortion care and access in North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, and we're a pilot fund of the National Network of Abortion Funds. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, just Google Carolina Abortion Fund and send an email saying that you're interested um, in joining the board and we can give you more information. I'll just say also that there are a lot of no, um, national organizations that have chapters across North Carolina. For example, BYP 100, Black Youth Pro, um, Project 100, a good friend of mine, Dee Dee Jackson, is the ED there, and they have a very, very strong North Carolina chapter. Um, and so reach out, like I think, Honestly, I hate to say this, but Google Google is a great way to start looking and exploring. I'll say for folks who are looking for like a Latinx affinity group, Mi Gente has a great um, kind of membership in North Carolina. And so if you're interested in that, um, I'll drop my email so that someone can put it in the Facebook Live as well. Um, but there are a lot of, I think, also like affinity groups and national groups that have smaller chapters in you know, in North Carolina. And then I'll just add that in addition to a lot of the amazing advisory councils that exist, there are cities that are doing things like participatory budgeting. So, you know, Guilford County, Greensboro had a big participatory budgeting pro, um, process, so did Durham. And these are also ways for folks who may be either permanently disenfranchised currently because they are non-citizens or disenfranchised because they're still um, you know, felons who are completing certain parts, aspects of their probation or parole, um, although we just had some good wins in that area, that there are other ways um, beyond just strictly voting to be civically engaged. So I'm really glad that you asked that question. And I'll just say there are also a lot of ways to get plugged in that aren't maybe formal um, you know, nonprofit organization. So I'm just in a signal thread with some folks who do eviction support for folks who are facing um, eviction. And so trying to get mutual aid to help them find other places if they're facing eviction. Um, and so I think there are informal networks and a good way to start is asking around and having conversation with your friends. Um, and just always a shameless plug for Google and our technology overlords, because you really can find things there. And even if you find something in a different state, you can always ask because a lot of these, you know, networks are connected. And so you can ask, hey, is there anything cool going on in North Carolina? Y'all popped up and they really might know something. So don't hesitate to reach out. And the internet is your friend for most things. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Particularly in this time where we are spending a lot of time in this virtual world, um, 
a lot of resources have popped up. Um, for a larger question, um, I think a lot of folks have really been sitting with and thinking about what is our democracy, right? What does it mean? What does it look like? Just from you all, what do you think needs to happen in order to reimagine our democracy? And what does our democracy need from us? Well, I'm, you know, unabashedly, personally, a, you know, kind of a far leftist, I'll say. And so I think the one of the first things we need to do is understand the historical legacy and the foundation of the United States, um, the foundation that laid the groundwork for the historical context that we particularly have in the US South, um, which is rooted in slavery and white supremacy. Um, and that a lot of the tax that we see on voting rights and on little d democracy really are foundational to some core aspects of how our country was founded. And so I think the first thing is kind of looking back so that we can look forward to reimagine. And I think a lot of ways in which um, sometimes we are on maybe the less effective end is when we're, you know, painting photo ideas just generally bad and not really naming the fact that this is targeted against Black voters, when we're kind of not looking at the actual kind of historical legacy of these um, voter suppression initiatives that we've seen in North Carolina in particular. And so I think that's one of the first things. I think the second thing is when I think about democracy and civic participation, I think it much of it much more broadly than just strictly the ability to vote. So, you know, I think a lot of change and progress has come in this country from militancy and from protest and from civil disobedience. Um, and so I think, you know, in order to think about democracy is broader than just voting, I think we really have to look at the legacy. You know, I think a lot of the expansiveness that we've gotten and the barriers that have reduced, you know, been reduced in the voting rights space have come from, you know, militant protests and folks who've had to stand up for their, their rights to, to vote. And so I think, you know, we, we can't deny that. And I think we also can't whitewash the historical legacy around access to the ballot for women as well. Like it was a deeply um, kind of racist fight that threw black women under the bus, um, frankly, in terms of that. And so I think we need to think about that when we're moving forward on democracy reform. Um, and maybe in my mind, I don't think of it as reform, I think of it as transition. So how do we transition to a more inclusive democracy, a democracy where folks feel that their voices are heard? And I think it really has to do with, as I mentioned, the kind of structural roots of what's underpinning our systems. And I'm really excited that, you know, at least at Democracy North Carolina, we're doing a lot of this good governance work and the money and politics work and understanding how some of these corrupting forces are perpetuating white supremacy. Um, and so I think we have to look at kind of all the ways in which our democratic practices are not accessible um, and sometimes are exclusive. And so I think things like participatory budgeting, things that bring people to the table who may not be able to vote or even interested in voting because there's apathy. And I think we have to be real about voter apathy um, and historically why voters have felt that they their you know vote doesn't have meaning in a, in a process where they're seeing outcomes that belittle you know their ability to exist in society. And so, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with organizing um, and holding space for culturally relevant and honest conversations about what democracy is. Um, and a lot of kind of reckoning, especially for white people to be honest about, about what democracy has looked like, which has been, you know, an institutional like power hoarding. Um, and so I think that's some of the work that needs to be done before we can even transform. But I think we're well on that path. I mean, I think we are on that pathway now. I think there are a lot of trailblazing organizations like BYP 100, Mihente, a lot of places that are harnessing conversations and also looking globally. You know, we talk about the United States as the epicenter of democracy. And I, I think we're seeing the ways in which 
you know, we're, we're not always the standard bearer. We can look to other countries who are having maybe more successful kind of democratic processes. There's no reason why we can't innovate in our democracy as well. Um, and honestly, a lot of folks have written on this in the academic space that our founding fathers did not think that we would be going this far with exactly the same system we had. You know, they really wanted, you know, innovation in that. And so I think we don't have to be you know, beholden to a system that we inherited from, from old dead white guys. Great, great ideas, but I think we can also improve on them. Lots more folks in the mix right now. So, you know, just a, a plug for, for looking back to look forward. Yeah, that, that's so important. And I'll just echo the notion that voting is the floor, not the ceiling. What democracy needs from us is participation. And I think it's important to commit to being a voter, to making sure your friends and your networks are voting. A lot of young people who maybe haven't voted before or not voted often, aren't necessarily on any list that any group out there, phone banking or text banking is gonna have, but they're folks you know and folks you can reach out to. So make being a voter a part of your identity and make sure to work in your circles to help folks vote. Make sure you're thinking about voting in every election, not just the presidential election. And one big thing I think about is that when you're doing voting work and organizing work, don't go alone. Organizing is a group activity. So find your group, find your people, find folks to plug in with and do it together. It's more sustainable that way. It's more effective that way. And you'll be really able to accomplish something. So, and, and one option I wanna plug, a shameless plug for You Can Vote. We are hiring paid summer fellows, part-time summer fellows. So if anyone's interested in doing that work and helping us go out there and register and educate voters, particularly voters who are targeted for voter suppression, we'd love to have you apply. Youcanvote.org slash fellowship. And I'll drop that link in the chat in a minute. But just to share a news flash with you, if you haven't noticed already, students are one of those groups that are targeted for voter suppression. And so we wanna make sure that everyone is able to vote. And in particular, my work is with college students and we'd love to have you apply to join our team or to volunteer with us. We do monthly meetings, we have lots of events. We'd love to have you be involved in that way. Thank you both um, for that. And since Jake already sort of uh, <laughs> gave some space for some summer opportunities um, that you can vote um, has going on. Um, Alyssa, would you like to share any opportunities that um, Democracy NC has? I would. So. We finished um, the initial hiring process for or screening process for the advocacy team, but there's still two great opportunities to intern. Um, and these are paid internships with Democracy North Carolina for 10 weeks over the summer. Um, one is with our communications and campaigns team. So those are the folks who make our podcast, who will be working on um, creating social media content, our petitions, our digital actions, um, the folks who will be helping us live tweet, you know, all of the tomfoolery that takes place in the legislature. Um, and then we also have our Dem Summer, Democracy Summer internship, which is I think last year was almost 20 students um, from across the state and a couple I think from outside of the state who work with our organizing team. Um, and they also work with our communications and campaigns team and they work with our team, the advocacy team. And so I will drop that link um, in the chat. And I will say that Southern Coalition for Social Justice is also looking for someone. Um, it's a shorter term project and I will drop that link as well in the chat. Um, it's a project that I think spans from April to May. Um, but it's an opportunity to do some data analysis on all of the amazing hotline election protection calls that we got. So we got over 14,000 calls in the fall um, with voters who had issues. And we are working really hard to understand some of the issues that voters had and where voters really needed certain key information, like their polling location or how to cure their absentee ballot. And so I'll drop those links in the chat. Thank you. Um, you both in your previous answers kind of talked about uh, the importance of understanding our history. Um, and as we've seen in 
we're kind of in this moment where there is a swell of activism, of organizing um, across various issues. We see um, Stacey Abrams down in Georgia organizing folks um, and really meeting people where they are, literally, um, to understand, uh, to get them to understand why it's important for them to turn out. Um, we also are seeing great organizing and activism coming across the country, including in Winston-Salem, around policing um, and folks sort of appealing to um, their elected officials. When we are thinking about um, advocacy around organizing um, and around activism, um, what is the, their role um, in making policy changes? Um, and also within that, Folks are, it, it can be really hard and a little scary to reach out to your elected officials. Um, so how do you suggest that folks uh, take those first steps? Well, as I mentioned, Democracy North Carolina has um, coalition meetings. And so that's a great way to kind of plug into an existing infrastructure of folks who have experience, who've reached out to their county board of elections, who've reached out to the state board of elections, who've reached out to representatives. And so I think a good way is to just get in with folks who've done that, who can make you feel a little more comfortable, some camaraderie in the space. Um, I will say also, Legislators don't get reached out to as much as you would think. You know, constituents rarely reach out to legislators. And a lot of times they do, you know, via digital action. That's like when you get an email and they kind of provide a script for you. Sometimes you can add your own little sentence or flavor to it and send it. Um, but genuine kind of single um, one-off emails about issues that are important to constituents don't really come across their desk a whole lot. And so I think it's a really, really important thing, especially for young people to engage with, um, because I think a lot of legislators may get contacted frequently by a handful of constituents who have, you know, either certain issues that they care about or one issue that they really care about and hammer away at. And so I think one of the first things is, you know, learning who your representative is, which, uh, I will say again, a quick Google search will help you figure it out. You can put in your address um, and it'll tell you who your representatives are. Um, a lot of them, not a lot of them, all of them have their email addresses listed right on their website. And so you can craft an email for them. Um, but you can also just connect with the, with the organizations that are in the space doing that work. So at Democracy North Carolina, I'll put a link, but you can find who your regional organizer is and chat with them um, and work together on creating an email. Um, if there's an issue that's of interest to you, particularly around voting rights. But there, I think there are a lot of ways to just reach out. And the other thing is our representatives work for us. They're elected by us to represent, you know, what we want them to do in office. And so you are a very, very important part of their every day-to-day -day job and they should be thinking about what their constituents want. And so I think the best way to hold them to account is to ask them for what you want them to do. Um, and I will say by and large, even the legislators who may not see eye to eye with us, you know, the worst that happens is they don't respond to you um, and that's not that bad. Um, and so if you look at it like other things in your life, potentially like dating, they might not answer, but at least you gave it a shot. Um, as they say, shoot your shot. So, I mean, and I think, you know, most representatives are responsive, even if it's a canned response. So, and, you know, if at first you don't succeed, you can email them again. Um, they're in the middle of long sessions. So I will say a lot of their time might be more constrained because they're in a lot of meetings, but definitely go ahead and reach out to them. Yeah, and I'm going to defer to Alyssa here because You Can Vote is not an advocacy organization. So democracy and Alyssa really has the expertise in that space. You can vote focuses more on the voter registration and the education. And so I am gonna drop one link in the chat for our what's on the ballot tool. One piece of our education is helping the voters understand what their elected officials do. And so we put together this tool that'll show you based on the different issues, whether you care about racial justice or climate or a variety of issues that are listed on the what's on the ballot tool, you can click in based on the issue. And then you can see right there, which elected officials have a role on that in different ways. And we kind of built it from the local up to the national. We didn't want to start with, here's what the president does. We want to start with the local folks and scroll down and you'll get to the state level folks and scroll down and you'll get to the national folks and Congress and the president and that kind of thing. 
So even though our role is more education than advocacy, that tool is currently being updated to be set for the elections ahead. But there's a lot of really great information there right now that will help you understand, okay, what role does my sheriff have in policing or the county commissioners have with the budget that goes into policing? Or what role does the city have? What role does the school of school board have? Like you can understand these different roles, where their funding comes from by looking at that what's on the ballot tool. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we're right at our last 10 minutes. And I know that folks are sitting here and listening and I feel really re-energized and excited after um, speaking with both of you. Um, one question that we get quite frequently um, for the folks at home, for students um, who are sitting there and are like, this is awesome. Like, I love the work that these folks are doing. How can I get into this line of work? What was your journey? Um, what do I need to do um, to get where you all are? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to share a few thoughts on this. Um, I've been in this line of work kind of professionally for about a decade. And before that, I was volunteering and working on campaigns in kind of a one-off way. So um, one thing I'll start by saying is it's important to, if you're doing this kind of work, to pace yourself, to do it sustainably, because I have seen some burnout over the years. So it's important to match your passion with a realistic thing, the notion that this is uh, not going to be a rush thing. Um, but yeah, for me personally, I know I was volunteering and working on a lot of campaigns and with a lot of organizations. And eventually I decided to quit the job I had, go to grad school for public administration and use that as my pivot to get into the sector. But there are lots of paths into this work. I see lots of people from social work backgrounds, from political science backgrounds, but really from any background out there. And so I would say the main thing is get some experience and do some job networking. That's important, networking is important. The um, Office of Career Development there at Wake Forest University will tell you that networking is a really important part of getting any kind of job. And that applies even to these jobs that are in the sphere of advocacy, of nonprofits, of voting, of organizing. And so volunteering and internships are a great way to do that. You build the experience, you learn the skills, and you meet the people. I know for me personally, before I worked at Democracy North Carolina, and before I worked at You Can Vote, I was a volunteer with both organizations. So I knew that work in and out because I'd been volunteering there for Democracy North Carolina, I'd been volunteering there for years. So I, I think that passion shows up when you do it that way. And I think you build the right connections and the right skills. I would also say, since I do regularly hire both interns and full-time staff, one thing I look for is personalized cover letters and to a great degree, even personalized resumes. I can't tell you how many times I've had a really generic cover letter that could work for any position, but it stands out to me when I see your passion come through, especially in those first few sentences. It stands out to me when I see you lift up your relevant skills or your interest, or if you haven't had a lot of the practice yet, just showing that passion, it matters, it stands out. And so I'd say really do the volunteering, get the internships, especially paid internships, if you can get them, it's important to value yourself and value your work, and then personalize and customize when you're applying for those kind of positions. Yeah, I'll just second, you know, what we used to call kind of in the law school world, informational interviewing, you know, it's kind of like a cold call, you're reaching out to someone. Um, and you're basically just saying, hey, I think what you do is really cool. I would love to talk to you about it. Do you have 10 or 15 minutes? Um, and you'd be surprised at how few people actually reach out to anyone on our staff, but I have very few people, you know, who've actually reached out to me based on our website. You know, I do have a lot of folks who reach out to me through friends, you know, who are like, hey, I know this young student, I'm mentoring them in this capacity. They love to hear about the work that you've done. I'd also say that, you know, we work in a system where we, we have to work to pay the bills and passion driven work is really, really important, but you also don't have to make it your full time career. There are a lot of people who go into the for profit sector or other sectors and do really, really meaningful volunteer work board work, um, you know, work in the community that that's just as meaningful. And what I will say is, you know, I was not a lifelong voting rights advocate before I landed the position I'm in, like do the work that feels passionate and important to you. And that will come through, you know, like that will, as Jake said, come through. And so, I mean, 
I was not hired at Democracy North Carolina because I was an election law expert. Um, I never took an election law or policy course the entire time that I was in law school. Um, you know, I focused a lot in law school on indigent criminal defense work. But once you have a certain base level of skills, once you have some program management skills or skills just in writing or policy, it's generally applicable to all areas of work. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't feel too too discouraged if you don't end up in a specific subject matter area that you're super excited about like you can hone the skills that you need and seek out those opportunities and I will just say as Jake mentioned you know there's ways in which the internship model makes it really really hard for folks who have to work through school or are not able to take unpaid work. Um, I'm proud to say Democracy North Carolina only accepts interns who are getting course credit for their work or paying. Um, we always pay our interns. Um, and so I will just say informal networking and not being afraid to just email folks is a great way for folks to get on the radar because I now have a list of young people who whenever we have opportunities, I'm emailing them all those opportunities. So even though they've never interned with us, I've had a chat with them and you know, it helps me you know, vie for them too in hiring processes. So don't be shy, don't be afraid. Um, and also, you know, if you find out that the nonprofit sector isn't for you after an internship, that's totally fine. You can support the cause in so many different ways. And you don't necessarily have to go into the nonprofit sector to be, you know, a really, really important contributor to social change. I want to thank you both for your time today. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure that our folks watching have learned a whole bunch. We took extensive notes. Um, so all of the resources that were dropped in the chat, um, all of that information, we are going to work um, through the Office of Civic and Community Engagement to compile all of that information and put it into a one-stop shop for folks. Um, so it'll all be there. Um, thank you both for your time, for your knowledge, um, and for being in community with me today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope that those watching learned a lot as well. And I hope that you